have a business plan, know exactly what it's going to take and have all of that mapped out while you still have that security that you desire or that you need. I did the business for an entire year while still working my corporate job until I finally took that leap and jumped in the deep end. So you find these amazing, outstanding folks. So you vet them and you hire them. How do you work now as a founder? Because there's a tricky part here. When you're a founder, it's your baby. You have the responsibility to the parents in developing a program where they have the autonomy with the nanny and you also are supporting the nanny. What are some of the things you put into place where there is safety for both the parent and you're managing but not hovering or over managing so that nannies would feel supported on both sides. Yeah. So we serve as the middleman between the nanny and the family. There's a disconnect in what the family desires or what the family's budget is and what the nanny desires and what is livable and sustainable for the nanny. So we bridge that gap and we help create those harmonious partnerships to where we can set up both the family and the nanny for long-term success. While we give the family a ton of autonomy in their partnership with their nanny, we give them the tools and the resources that they need to successfully partner with their nanny. And we also, even beyond the placement, serve as a resource. The family is employing the nanny. We are simply the middleman making the partnership harmonious, creating that partnership, bridging that gap. But beyond the placement, we really trust that nannies and families are going to run with that partnership. Now, we have an open door. If there's ever an issue that arises, a nanny has reached back out to us and said, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. How should I handle it? And we'll kind of help break that ice. Or a parent reaches out to us and says, I'm really frustrated with my nanny and here's what the issue is. And then giving that family practical tips and tools and resources of like how to navigate this situation. Here's how to have that conversation with your nanny. Because a lot of times it's like a marriage where you have to be comfortable having difficult conversations. You have to be comfortable giving feedback. And you have to be also respectable, right? Like you have to have that relationship and rapport with each other and the respect, but also the boundaries, right? Where it's like, hey, I didn't like how you handled this. And this is how I would like you to handle it moving forward. If I were to give that feedback to my nanny. But also my nanny knowing that, okay, absolutely, not a problem. Happy to adopt that, open to that feedback. But also making sure that when you create that match, that you're not putting an alpha with an alpha, right? That we know, hey, this is, mom is someone that takes the reins and she's going to lead and she wants a nanny that's going to come in there, do a good job, but also follow her lead. And that we are creating and placing nannies with families that are a match because that's crucial. To go back to the original question you asked is making sure that there's an open door for the parents and for the nannies because we, at the end of the day, are not the employer. We are merely the agency that does all of the connecting, the vetting, the sourcing, the qualifying, all of that. So there is a lot of autonomy as it relates to how the parent partners and employees that nanny. But we always have that open door policy to where we will continue to consult and have a relationship with the family and the nanny to help, again, continue to bridge that partnership and create an environment where everyone feels comfortable having difficult conversations. One of the most important thing is to be able to have and give feedback. And you as a company owner knows what your why is. Why are you there? And you have that vision in mind. And it seems like everyone has a role and everyone's role is very clearly defined and understood. 
that creates this environment. And that, again, happened after you knew the processes and procedures, and this is how you're going to function. So that really seems like there are processes in place. So how do you, in your past company, you were working with going, going, going 50 miles an hour or more and being the top performer. And in this company, it's your own baby. How do you balance your home and family and work life? And what has been the most joyful experience since you began, especially with your family? I actually just had this conversation the other day where I said it was easier when I worked in a corporate setting because I could leave, go away for the weekend, go away on vacation for the week and ignore everything that was work related for that week and just compartmentalize it and just know I'll get to it when it, you know, come Monday, I'll address that or I will address that when I'm back from vacation. And as a business owner, you don't really have that luxury. It's, I mean, could I? Could I put it on the back burner until Monday? Sure. But do I want to? Absolutely not. Even then, when I worked in a corporate setting, that is what set me apart as a top performer is I wasn't the person that waited until Monday. I wasn't the person that was like, you know what? This can wait until I get back from vacation. I was working evenings. I was working weekends. I was answering emails on vacation. It was, it was fine. So I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit and that willingness to go above and beyond the call of duty. In my corporate setting, I had that option. Not to say that I exercised it. <laughs> and, but in business, I don't feel like I have that option. Like it's make or break and failure is not an option. I mean, it actually it is. I thought about that. <laughs> in the past, failure wasn't an option. Now it's like, and I even ask myself, why am I doing this? I don't have to do this. I'm in a position in my life where, you know what? If I wanted to be a stay at home mom and just no care in the world, go to yoga on Wednesdays, you know, like casually have brunch with my friends, like I could do that. But it's just not the way that I'm wired. I have this like burning desire to make a difference and to use my past experiences for good. And I feel like I am the voice and the representative for a lot of moms. And my gift and my skills are intended to be used for good. And so here I am and I'm doing it. And I sometimes ask myself, am I crazy? Because I'm doing something that I don't have to do, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> Seems like it's a lot of joy and, and you know what you want and you know you have a choice. Everyone's so different. So there are some leaders that are like, hey, I just want nine to five and I'm just going to do. But knowing who you are and if you can't handle it and you need to look for an email, if it works, there's no right and wrong answer. Often we hear, you know, we should turn it off and there's got to be a work life balance. But if your balance is that, that if you would just be so anxious, if you didn't check your emails or you didn't support the parent who needed help on the weekend, and of course, I'm sure you have some boundaries and limits around it. So if it's like a continuous something, you're going to create a boundary around it. So how long have you been uh, running the new business? A little over two years now. So in two years, you probably have some experiences. So what lessons have you learned from your journey as a parent entrepreneur? And what advice would you offer to other parents considering being entrepreneurs themselves and going out and starting a business of their own? It would be just to be authentic, identify who you are, what makes you tick, what doesn't, and be true to yourself. Like you were just saying about work-life balance. What does that mean to me? That might mean to me something different than it means to you entirely, right? And so I feel like culture and society puts all these like parameters in place and ideologies of what work-life balance is, right? But that's different for everyone. If I didn't answer my emails on the weekend, it would like, I'm the type of person that until it is off my desk, it will sit there in my mind and it'll just resonate and resonate and just reminder, don't forget, you have this email, don't forget, you know, waiting till Monday is more stress than it is just a boom, 
answer the email, get it off my plate, done. That to me is what is authentic and true to me. That's what makes me feel at ease. That might not be true for someone else. And figuring out what does that look like to you? Don't assess what that is culturally or to society or what people are pushing. What is it that you desire? What is it that makes you feel good and at peace and do that? And don't worry about what others are doing. Do what feels authentic and good and right to you. So Stephanie, when you first started your business, I know when I started my business, finances again, we go back to it because that could be really challenging for someone who's starting a business for the first time. What are some of the things to consider in terms of money coming in and being able to sustain your business past the first few years? What practices could you impart for others to learn from your situation? So I would say it's one to have a plan, have a business plan, know exactly what it's going to take and have all of that mapped out while you still have that security that you desire or that you need. And then, you know, continue to do the business on the side. That's what I did personally was I did the business for an entire year while still working my corporate job until I finally took that leap and jumped in the deep end because I knew that the business wasn't going to be profitable initially, that it would take time for that. And then even when it was profitable, being in a position to take those profits and put it back into the business. Because the sooner you pay yourself, you delay that ROI, that long-term ROI, right? So it's it's kind of like if you have a vehicle, but you have no money for to put gasoline in it, it's going to go not very far. And the age-old saying of it takes money to make money. You have to put money out there. You have to invest. So you can either pay yourself and deplete the business or you can put the money back into the business and keep fueling it like if, as if it was an engine, right, that needed coal and they keep putting coal into the engine to keep it going. It's the same idea. So you can find that balance to where maybe there's a percentage that you pay yourself, you know, just to keep yourself going, like your livelihood. But otherwise, in a ideal situation, you would keep putting back into the business because long-term, that's going to be far more beneficial than it is to deplete the business. That's very sound advice. I think just having a nest egg and just having a plan in place and things are going up and down. And especially in the last three, four years, as the world is shifting, everything else, the cost of goods have gone up. And we're, we're seeing a variety of challenges to sustain a business in this time, it requires us to have courage, to have a plan in place to pivot, and also support systems. So Stephanie, what is your support system? Now, you know, when you were in a workplace, you had your colleagues and your supervisors or mentors. Now, who's your sounding board? And how do you surround yourself with others that can help you sort of not be so alone? So my business partner is my first sounding board. It's nice to have someone to bounce ideas back and forth with, you know, and to share those tribulations and trials and struggles with. That's really nice. But I would say my support system is my husband mostly because he's been in business for over 25 years. So he knows, you know, what it is in those infant stages of business and what it entails. But also I have help on the home front too. Right. So I have a household manager that helps with general tidiness of my home, with laundry, cleaning, you know, making the beds, all of the things that take me away from being productive in my business that are, that is busy work that I have help on the home front. I also have the help from my husband. Having that support system makes it possible for me to give the time that I need to my business. Otherwise, without that support, I would not have the time to give to my business because I would have family demands that needed my attention. And so I am very fortunate to have that support on the home front that allows me the time that I want to give to my business so that I can fulfill those things that 
I'm on fire about, right? That identity that I have in my business or in my contribution to society, that it's fulfilling. And without that support, I wouldn't be able to do it. Absolutely. And it sounds like you take care of yourself so you can be the whole person to be present for others. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for having this conversation and encouraging those who have amazing ideas and they might, from listening to your this podcast, have the ability or a few encouraging spots that they can use to just project to the next level. And you are listening to Jagged Edge Podcasts for Leadership. And hopefully we have inspired you or shared a few tools with you. And thank you, Stephanie, for being with us today. If you like this episode, please don't forget to follow. And if you would like to join other social media, it's Yogi Patel underscore TTE. And Stephanie, how can folks find you? They can find us on hellonanny.com, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, or www.hellonanny.com. Thank you again. Thank you. If you like the content of this video, please don't forget to follow. And also, if you want more information, visit the website yogipatelttte.com.